Rumbling across Europe is a new Nazi super weapon. From night vision equipped Panther G tanks to super heavy mouse tank, Nazi Germany proved throughout the war to be the most innovative and somewhat crazy in designing combat vehicles both wheeled and track. But one of these paper panzers was unlike all the others. A fortress of steel powered by submarine engines with the main armament being an actual battleship gun turret. A thousand ton beast to crush everything in its way and be the backbone of the Nazi war machine in its conquest of the world. This is the story of certainly the craziest armoured vehicle concept in history. One tank to rule them all, the P-1000 Ratte. In 1941, the German war effort was looking for a new type of tank to combat the rise of Soviet armour. A tank that would be able to not only take out the best of the USSR, but also take hits without flinching. The study would eventually lead to the development of the 200 ton tank, the Panzer VIII Maus. But during the development, there was a rather interesting idea that the engineers couldn't quite shake. What if somehow they put a battleship on land? And like all insane ideas during the Nazi reign, when it reached Hitler's desk, it was approved. On the 23rd of June 1942, the director of Krupp, Edward Grote, suggested that they could build a 1000 ton tank. It would be dubbed a new category of tank called a land cruiser or land kreuzer that would weld surplus battleship guns, have 25 centimeter thick armor, and be its own anti-aircraft gun platform. For comparison, one of the best armored German tanks of the war, the Jagdtiger, only had frontal casemate armor of 250 millimeters, and it's said to be never pierced frontally during its combat deployment in all of World War II. And thus, the most insane tank project of the war, and perhaps even since then, was born. Trying to fund such a super project today would be nearly impossible to finance, and for good reason. There are much better investments today, like fine art. But Nick, you ask me, I'm not a billionaire. How would I be able to invest in art at all? Well, that's where masterworks.io steps in today's video sponsor. Masterworks.io is the first and only platform to fractionally invest in famous artworks. That's right, you will own a part of incredible pieces of history and have the potential to profit from it too, based on historical performance. You see, most billionaire collectors invest anywhere from 10 to 30% of their portfolio to art, and for good reason. Contemporary art prices outpace the S&P 500 total return by by 174% from 1995 to 2020. That's like going from a small Airbus A220 to a mighty triple decker. Is it legit? Yes. Masterworks is the first company to offer paintings filled with the Securities and Exchange Commission as public offering. Some of the works they have include names like Banksy, Monet and Basquiat and more. And you don't have to wait for these items to reach auction, using the secondary market to sell at any time your share to another member. Getting started with Masterworks is super easy. It just takes a few clicks. You visit their website, create an account, browse their artwork, and you can diversify your portfolio with one of the most stable assets around. Is anyone doing it? Yes again. Over 300,000 investors have already signed up. In fact, one of their latest offerings by famous street artist Banksy sold out in under three hours. If you want to take advantage and invest in some fine art, outside of my channel of course, then there is a waitlist. But you can skip that waitlist and immediately start investing by clicking my link in the description. And it also really supports the channel, so go check it out. The P-1000 would have been huge. With a weight of 1,000 tons, it was five times bigger than even the heaviest Nazi tank of the war, the Panzer VIII. 
The tank would have been able to hold several motorcycles for scout missions in infirmary and had its own internal toilet system. To carry all this weight around over the ground and not just sink into a crater, the mass would have been spread over six 1.2 meter treads. Although even with all its effort, the weight of the tank would have obliterated any sort of ground from roads to farms to buildings. Its actual size was staggering as well. At 39 meters long, gun to tail, 14 meters wide and 11 meters high, as big as a four story building. This height and 2 meter ground clearance would mean that it would be able to cross most rivers without any issues. A good thing too, as bridges were out of the question. To power the tank, it would have two diesel engines used in U-boats, with 8,400 horsepower each, with a total of 16,000 horsepower required to move the gigantic steel monster. Snorkels located across the frame would supply the engines with oxygen in the case of a river crossing. All of this was designed to carry its battleship-grade cannons. The primary weapon of this super tank would have been two 280mm naval guns, the ones left over after the planned refitting of the Schoenhorst class battleships. They didn't want to use a three gun turret because with the middle gun removed, there would be more room for ammunition, sighting and reducing the weight of the tank by 50 tons. The cannons would have fired the same shells used by the battleships or would have used special armor piercing rounds and high explosive rounds for dissolving enemy armor or plowing up ground fortifications respectively. But wait, there's more. The tank had several other cannons on board, such as a single 128mm anti-tank cannon, most likely the Pac-44, or rather its sub-variant, the Kava Ka-44, used later in the Yag Tiger and Mouse, and planned for the E-100 tank. Apart from that, there were two turrets on the back equipped with the same gun and four turrets with either double 20 or 37mm anti-air auto cannons or quad 20mm guns along with several machine guns. It's not clear how many crew this tank would have required, but judging by the smaller 200 ton Panzer 8 mouse requiring 6, we can imagine that this larger brother would be 20 to 41 men with a commander, multiple gunners and loaders, drivers, radio operators, engineers and scouts, as well as a doctor for the infirmary. With all these guns, armor and internal toilets, the tank itself would only have been able to move at a top speed of 40 kilometers per hour and have a range with its fuel tanks of 190 kilometers. Even this, however, was highly unlikely and doubted from the start. Likely it also would have required a support convoy, escorts and supply lines much like we see today in an aircraft carrier group. To answer the question where it would have been deployed is quite obvious. The Eastern Front or Belgium, Netherlands and Northern France because of the simple fact that it could traverse mostly if not strictly across the flat terrain due to its weight and dimensions. The other important question is how it would have been deployed and we can only speculate, but most likely Germans would use it as a mobile heavy artillery platform using it to destroy enemy bunkers, fortresses and heavily defended positions. The use of it against enemy armor is highly unlikely because of the very slow speed and agility, but it could have been used as a medium to long range support for the armored units on the battlefield with extremely accurate fire that could be coordinated during the assault. However, having in mind that most German operations were defensive from 1943, the purpose of this super tank was questionable. Would this tank be the wonder weapon that would save Nazi Germany? By December 29th of 1942, a few preliminary designs of the tank had been drafted. It had finally gotten a name, the Rat, likely because of the smaller brother was a mouse. It was preparing to enter prototype stage when some flaws were discovered. The fact that it couldn't use any roads, tunnels or cross any bridges greatly hampered its actual operational feasibility. It would have not been able to invade cities nor really protect any industrial targets. Moving around, it would have done more damage than the enemy. 
With its speed only being 40 kilometers per hour, enemy armor could easily go around it, either encircling it to attack from weak spots or straight up bypass it completely. Its huge size and slow speed would have also made it very vulnerable to airstrikes, even with its eight AA guns. The allies would have seen it coming, impossible to hide after all, and a few bombers would make short work of it. Lastly, thanks to its huge size, it would be completely reliant on its own engines and drivetrains. If the tank broke down, it would become a giant paperweight. There was no other way to drag it or tow or even put it on rail. Speaking of, the tank couldn't be transported via trains because of its size and weight. Perhaps the Breitzbebran that was also envisioned by Nazi Germany would be able to carry this steel monster. Another issue is that the Allies and Soviets would probably make it their top priority to get rid of these beasts. Just like the Bismarck, Dirbitz and Yamato were hunted to kill at any cost, the same fate would await the Rate on the battlefield, making it more of a nuisance to defend rather than the effective assault weapon. But you know for absolute fact that the story doesn't end here. Because instead of just cancelling the project, they thought, why not just make the tank bigger? 500 tons bigger. I know you think by this point that these Nazi projects couldn't get any more ridiculous, but the Landkreuzer P1500 monster was certainly up there. The P-1500 was going to be a self-propelled gun platform carrying a 800mm cannon with a range of 37 kilometers. It would have had 250mm hill front armor requiring four diesel engines and have over 100 crew members. It would essentially be the same as the famous Schwerwe Gustav railway gun but without the railway. It would be incredibly slow, however, cruising around Europe at walking speed of seven kilometers per hour. Whilst this project is popular, there isn't any real solid design work found, leading many to consider this either the work of a lone engineer or perhaps even a straight propaganda hoax. Needless to say, both this cannon tank and the P-1000 both suffered the flaw of being too big, too slow, and too vulnerable to Allied aircraft, an air advantage that the Allies had secured by 1943. As such, the Minister of Armaments, Albert Speer, cancelled both projects and the world never got its super tank. If you want to see more Nazi content, then I suggest you check out our other video about the insane Nazi railway, or perhaps the supposed Nazi experiments with UFO technology. This video today was originally pitched to us by our Patreon, Big Dan. If you would like to become a Patreon just like Big Dan and go on to suggest topics for Found and Explained, then I'll leave a link down in the description where you can become a Patreon, see videos early, discuss with us, and as I said, suggest ideas. And we also have channel members with the exact same benefits. So thanks again so much for watching and see you all in the next video.